Hello, we're here with Judge David Keenan, who is running for re-election for King County Superior Court, position 26. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Sure. Uh, so I'm Dave Keenan. When I'm asked why am I running for election, the really straightforward answer is that I love, love, love this job. I'd like to keep it not just for another four years, but I'm, I'll be 50 this year. So it's mandatory retirement for judges at age 75. I'd love to keep it for the next 25 years if I could. It's even better than I hoped it would be when I ran for election in 2016. So I'm just hoping to keep this job. And when I ran in 2016, I ran on a platform. And there were really th three issues that I ran on. Legal financial obligations, which is ending the practice of uh, basically courts running debtors prisons, uh, juvenile justice reform, and then civil legal aid for low-income people. And I think I've made good on that, on that work, on that platform. I serve on the Access to Justice Board statewide, which is civil legal aid. I serve on the board of Choose 180, which is juvenile justice reform. And then I serve on a statewide task force regarding legal financial obligations. I was endorsed by the 36th in 2016 and all 17 actually King County legislative district, district organizations and the King County Dems and the King County Young Democrats. I think I'm pretty much the only incumbent other than the two new judges out running right now. And, and that's not to disparage the incumbents at all. Everybody takes a different approach to elections. But what I do know is that under the ethics rules, the only time I can come and speak with you is during a campaign. And I just didn't want to miss that opportunity to come and get a sense for what the community is feeling, how I can do better, and to just make the case for another four years. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to move into our prepared questions. And the responses <laughs> to these would be two minutes apiece. And Alice will be keeping time. Uh, Laura, would you like to go ahead with the first question? And Robert, would you post those into the chat here? Thank you. What are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? You know, it's, it's a great question because when I was an advocate, I could go in and, and pick a side. Um, and as a decider, there are some times where I really want to pick a side, but the law won't allow me to do that. Uh, and I think that's, that's the con right, is that sometimes I have to make a decision uh, in favor of someone on an issue where if I was an advocate, I would be forcefully advocating for the other side. So that's a huge con. But the pro is, the biggest pro is that I get to move the law forward in areas where there hasn't been law before. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the legal issue is very clear and the answer is clear and I have no real room to go a different way. But many times there isn't a clear answer. And when there isn't a clear answer, I can take my lens. And so that's my upbringing, growing up in poverty, being a high school dropout, having my own experience with the juvenile justice. One minute. And use that to, to apply my lens to my answer. And that's the biggest pro to me is that there is room, I think, in the law for me to bring my background um, to bear. So one very quick example as my time begins to expire is last year we had an issue where a 17-year-old was charged as an adult and the state was asking for $65,000 in restitution. There was no law uh, in this 30 area. Seconds. And I went back and I, I thought to myself, I grew up in poverty. I had experience with the juvenile justice system. There isn't a clear answer this, to this, so let me see if I can apply the Eighth Amendment, which nobody had done before, to find a way to not impose restitution uh, on this young man. And that's exactly what I did, because otherwise it would have been a life sentence uh, in terms of the amount of money he would have owed to the courts. Thank you. Uh, Lori, would you like to ask question two? Happy to. Thank you. What have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency? What other methods might you suggest? You know, I think the biggest, the, the, the most effective methods for improving, improving court efficiency don't actually happen in court. They happen before court. And I go and speak about this a lot in the community about what I call front end investments. And I always say, you can't, if you want to talk about what the least effective 
measures are, uh, the least effective measures are dealing with everything on the back end when somebody comes to court and they don't have counsel uh, and none of their legal issues or problems have been diagnosed and then I'm trying to do those on the fly while I'm in court. That is the least effective uh, way to go about things. And I would analogize it to somebody who doesn't have health insurance and they had a small issue that developed a year ago but they didn't have health insurance, so they didn't go to the doctor, and now they're in, they're in the emergency room. And oftentimes, as a judge, I feel like I am the legal emergency room dealing with somebody who, if they'd only had access to counsel a year before, wouldn't be in crisis right now. And the most effective ways, the most effective means, I think, are investing in civil legal aid for low-income people. So, for example, in the legislature right now, we have something called the Civil Justice Reinvestment Act. And as a member of the statewide access to justice board and as a prior president of the board of Northwest justice project, this is something I support, which is increasing the number of civil legal aid attorneys to address civil legal problems for individuals so that either a, they don't end up in court because they get that treatment. If you want to analogize it again to the healthcare system uh, or B when they come to court, they have, when they come to court, they have an attorney. Um, so I think those are some of the least and most effective, uh, ways to address issues that I see in court, front-end investments, not waiting until somebody comes to me in crisis. Great, thank you. Summer, would you like to go ahead with the next question? I think we're on three. Nope, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry. As a judge, uh, what do you consider to be your greatest strengths and weaknesses? I, I think that my uh, greatest strength is my humility and uh, when I got elected, but had not been sworn in yet, I remember I was talking with Judge Linda Lau, who's retired from the Court of Appeals and now does uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution. And she said to me, don't be an insecure judge. And what she meant by that, she explained, she said, don't be a judge who goes into court, pretends that you know everything when you know you don't know everything, and doesn't ask questions because you're too insecure to ask questions. And so... From the moment I started on the bench, my very first trial was a first degree rape, first degree burglary trial, a pretty tough trial to start in. And I went into court and I said, folks, I'm brand new here. I want you to stop me if you think I'm doing something wrong. I want you to correct me. The most important thing is that we get this right for your clients, for the defendant and for the people of the state of Washington. It's not important that I look like I know what I'm doing if I don't One know minute. what I'm doing. Um, and then something that I've been working on um, summer, which I think is a weakness of mine, but I've been working on is being a better listener in court. Sometimes I'll get a little impatient and say, folks, I know where you're going with this. Why don't you answer this question for me? And there are two things that I've done recently to address that. One is I've just finished a book called You're Not Listening. And when I say I just finished it, I just finished it three days ago. It's a new book. It's a fantastic 30 seconds. It's really helpful. And then I read another book last year uh, called Know My Name, which was, rep which was rec uh, recommended to me um, by a trial attorney. And that's the story of the victim of uh, what many people know as the, uh, the Stanford swimmer rapist, which is a terrible way to refer to him because he's just a rapist. He's not, being a swimmer has nothing to do with anything. But she talked about her experience in the criminal justice system. And it was so helpful to hear her perspective on how the judge treated her. And I think that's going to make me a better judge. Great. Thank you. And uh, Jeff, you're on question four. All right. Uh, describe your most difficult case. Why was it difficult? How did you handle it? Sure. Uh, you know, I think I've had a lot of difficult cases. Uh, I will say to you, the most difficult case I've had in the last several months was a dependency matter. I'm on the civil rotation right now, which is mostly uh, lawsuits involving insurance and businesses and things like that. Uh, but sometimes I'll get a dependency case and a dependency case for those of you who haven't practiced in that area and aren't lawyers is where the state is trying to take away somebody's parental rights uh, and make the child dependent upon the state. And this was a case where we had two opioid dependent parents who clearly loved, loved their child, uh, but absolutely could not care for him. And 
what was hard about that is balancing a parent's love for their child with their utter inability to care for them because of their addiction. Um, and ultimately where I landed is I did find the child dependent. So I did take the child away from the parents, took away their parental rights, but not without first putting in place a plan, a path back for the parents to get services so that they could try and find their way back to getting their parental rights to be with their child. But what was so hard about that is just so many dynamics, right? Opioid dependence, um, the inability, the ineffectiveness uh, of our criminal justice system in addressing um, uh, chemical dependency, uh, the inability of our state uh, to provide services or enough services to people who are opioid dependent. And then a child's love for his parents and a parent's love for their child. So that was, I think, the toughest case I've had in a long time. Great, thank you. Uh, and now we can move to follow-up questions. Uh, the responses to these are one minute apiece. Uh, would anybody like to ask a follow-up question? Hannah. Um, you had mentioned that one of your goals going into all of this was um, sort of looking at and, and reworking the juvenile justice system. Obviously, that's something that's been top of mind in King County in the last few years. Can you speak a little bit to sort of what you're thinking about as far as like the future of juvenile justice in our area and, and what your role in that is? I'd be happy to. Uh, so much of it is about moving the investments from the back end to the front end. And I give these talks about the school to prison pipeline, but I call it the birth to prison machine because I think it starts earlier than school. And it's the result of a system that is set up to, to produce these results. It's not a pipeline. It's really a machine. And two things that I would highlight very quickly. One is eliminating out of school suspensions. Uh, and so I'm on the board of Choose 180. We're in the schools now working with kids who would normally receive an out-of-school out suspension, which is a predictor for juvenile justice system involvement. And another is alternative to alternatives to arrest. We see so many domestic violence cases, not domestic violence cases between partners, but between parents and children, where the police arrest the child. And if they just had a community rest stop, someplace for that child to go for a Ten while seconds. to take the time out, they'd be so much better off. Thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions? I have one. Um, do judges have an obligation to improve uh, public understanding of the courts? And if so, how should they carry out that obligation? They do. And uh, I think that the, the judges should be out in the community as much as they possibly can be. And I think I do that. Uh, so I go and I speak at grade schools, middle schools, uh, and high schools, and colleges, and law schools. I do that throughout the year, and I especially try to focus um, on communities that I think have been the most impacted by the justice system so that they can understand where the problems are in the justice system and what we're trying to do to fix it, and so that I can get their input. So I've gone down seconds. and spoken at Evergreen and White Center and Rainier Beach High School, which is just a few minutes uh, from my house. Uh, so I do think that judges have uh, a tremendous responsibility to speak about and write about the justice system and to invite people into the courts, which I do a lot as well. I have a lot of classrooms that will come down and visit me. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We still have uh, about seven more minutes. Or six other questions. Yes, Jeff. So, um, as you know, the court system and the justice system are underfunded, like a lot of government. And I was wondering what you thought the role um, of a judge what would be to, um, or what you have done, to advocate for more funding for the courts and the judicial system. Yeah, I think that there is a role, Jeff, and I don't know what the stat is now, but I remember reading that Washington was very close to the bottom, like in the 40s in terms of state funding for the court system, which is a real shame. And we have a statewide Superior Court Judges Association, which is an organization of all 193 Superior Court judges in the state of Washington. 
I joined the legislative committee in my very first year uh, on the bench so that I would be able to have a voice for all the Superior Court judges in Washington and Olympia. And we do advocate for funding and other changes to the law. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of competition 30 seconds. For, for those scarce funds, and there'll be even more now. Um, but I do think judges should be forcefully advocating uh, for funding for the court system because Unfortunately, there is there aren't a lot of other constituencies that are out there advocating for court funding. So I think we have to speak up for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions uh, for Judge Keenan? Let me scroll through real quick. Um, I have one. Uh, what are your views on the need for more diversity on the bench and the manner in which courts uh, treat members of different races? Uh, we do need more diversity on the bench. And I think Governor Inslee has done a good job uh, with his appointments. I would say, and I keep statistics on this myself because I want to know what the numbers are. We don't have in particular on the King County Superior Court bench, in my view, enough women on the bench, uh, enough, women, enough women of color. We're a majority of women, but we don't have nearly enough women of color on the bench, and I'd love to see that change. And I work on trying to do my part in building a pipeline by mentoring lawyers from the Korean American Bar Association and other affinity bars um, that work with under, upper and under, underrepresented 30 communities. Seconds. In terms of how the courts treat communities of color, we have so much more work to do uh, with gaining trust uh, in communities of color. One area where we are falling down, although I know many good judges are working on this, uh, is jury selection, uh, because our juries are under-inclusive of our community, and we can do so much better than just continuing to draw from voters' records and driver's license and identity card records. We need to pay jurors more and provide them with child care. Thank you. Are there I like that bell. That's the first time I heard that. I'm trying to make it very soothing. I don't want to startle anyone. So. <laughs> it sounded like the be like a bell that you might hear at the beginning to a children's show on, on PBS when I was a child. Exactly. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have a, a question to ask? Hannah. Can you say more about paying jurors more and childcare? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so you might know that very recently the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, ruled against uh, individuals that were trying to, uh, they were making a claim that juror, low juror pay in King County was discriminatory. I think it is discriminatory. The court disagreed and there were, there were, there were justices that were on both sides, but it certainly excludes low income communities. And so it disproportionately affects our communities of color, our LGBTQ communities, and our immigrant and refugee communities. So right now, the maximum we could pay a juror by statute is $25. I think at a minimum, we should be paying jurors a living wage per hour and providing them childcare because so many jurors end up excusing themselves, asking to be excused because they simply can't afford to stay on a jury because they'll be losing money from work and not, having, not being able to afford childcare. Great. Um, thank you. Does anybody have a final question? I'd like to give everyone a chance to have the opportunity. I have one more then. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you possess any expertise in a field other than law? Other than baking? Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, I spent 15 years in law enforcement, um, well, 14 years and eight months and investigated human trafficking uh, and fraud and, and internet crimes against children. So I have a lot of expertise there. Um, and uh, beyond that, I can't, can't think of anything in particular. You know, Nicole, I love to write. And I get, I scratch that itch uh, in my law practice, but I love to write. And well, I'll say this, last night I uploaded a video to the King County Young Democrats site uh, in which I am TikTok dancing. 
Uh, so that, uh, if you watch that, you will probably agree with me that I have no expertise in that area whatsoever. Um, <laughs> But I do know a lot about human trafficking and financial crimes uh, and internet crimes against children and money laundering and terrorist finance from my years in law enforcement. Great, thanks. I always like learning new things about <laughs> you. Um, if you would like to take a minute to go ahead and wrap up, you can tell people who might be watching later on uh, why they should vote for you. Sure. As I said at the beginning, I love this job. Um, substantively, I just love the work. I look forward to coming to work each day. And when I see a case in an area of law that is new to me, I'm really excited because I think here's an opportunity for me to buckle down, learn this new area of law very quickly. I think as Nicole said a moment, become a subject matter and help people decide because something is broken down when people come to court and I want to help them resolve those crises. I definitely believe as I said in 2016 when I ran the first time, that judges should have a platform. They should have something that they wanna do with the office. I wanna continue in particular to do this work around civil legal aid for low-income people, juvenile justice reform, and legal financial obligation reform. And that's why I'm out campaigning. It's 2020, I don't know if I'll get an opponent, but I know that this is the only time I get to come and, come and talk with you, and that's why I'm here. And I'm grateful for everything that the 36 does in the community. And I'd be grateful for your endorsement. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.